we all know few ways how to use our smartphones and, and other uh, Mojo equipment, but we don't know everything and there is more every day. This is also really interesting. Please welcome Björn Staschen and Vitse Wellingre. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Well, he introduces us a good. little bit. First reaction from the audience. <laughs> One said good morning as well. Yeah, all oh, good. Well, we'll wake you up in a bit. Uh, let's first introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Vitsi Fallinga and I work here in Leeuwarden at Omrop Friesland. Um, I am a mobile journalist, which means I shoot all my footage with my mobile phone and use my mobile phone for radio work and for online. Well, actually, I don't have a computer or anything else, so I'll just use my mobile phone. And I'm Bjorn Staschen. I work with NDR Norddeutsche Rundfunk in Hamburg. Basically, started doing the same as Vize and now leading a small unit at NDR. We're trying to encourage more people to shoot with their mobile phones for linear television and social media. And we believe in this technology so much that we actually wrote a book about it. A uh, book. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't forget about the book, which is uh, called Mobile Storytelling, a journalist guide into the uh, a smartphone galaxy, which is a bit confusing because some people think that we only use galaxy smartphones. <laughs> It's not, it's not. It's, it's, it's sort of a reference to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But we didn't think that true, maybe. <laughs> but uh, we're not the only ones shooting stuff on mobile phones. So just to wake you guys up, a small clip. Humans fascinate me. They are capable of the most noble and unselfish acts. And at the same time, the worst of the atrocities. Their soul can be a source of unlimited goodness or a dark, filthy well. Evil can take many and different forms, but there is only one immutable constant common to all men. They always try to run away when it is time to pay off debts. So did that wake you up? <laughs> Usually I, people get shocked by that. Maybe the sound should have been more up. Uh, it's, it's just one of uh, many films that are now made with mobile phones. This was the trailer of a movie that uh, a guy named Konrad Mess, uh, which sounds German, but he's actually from Spain, uh, made a couple of years ago. Uh, with his iPhone uh, 6, which is now already three years old. Um, and this picture is actually from Steven Soderbergh, uh, a famous Hollywood uh, director, famous for movies like Ocean's Eleven. Uh, and he shot his la latest uh, uh, movie theater uh, film with an iPhone 7 Plus and a gimbal. Um, and you can actually see that in theaters now, so on a big screen. And if uh, Hollywood believes in it, why shouldn't we as broadcasters believe in it? So let's have a quick chat to get you going. Can we see everyone's phone? Who's got the phone with himself this morning or with herself? Can you hold them up really high? There you go. Many news crews in the room. In old days, we would have had satellite news gathering trucks on the parking lot. Now you've got all the phones with you. Hold them up so we can see them, please. That's good, that's promising, isn't it? Uh, it's promising. I just spot one tiny problem. Most of them were holding them the wrong way. Were they? Yes, they were. Yeah. Twice. Now, more on the images of a bullying incident in Leicester. This mobile phone footage appears to show a group of young people victimising an elderly man. I'm joined now by Chief Inspector Wendy Mackay. It's a tough watch, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, this footage is nothing short of appalling. You have to wonder at the mentality of these people. If you're going to film an abusive incident, why on earth would you do it in portrait mode? Yeah, because TV is broadcast in landscape format, and if you film something in portrait, it takes up, what, 
a third of the screen, which means that we have to then put the blurry stuff either side. You know that, I know that, the vast majority of decent people know that. But unfortunately, there are some people who are just profoundly ignorant of the correct aspect ratio. Is there anything that can be done about this disturbing trend? The temptation is to write these people off, but I really believe that with the right sort of support, they can quite literally turn their lives around. Thank you, Chief Inspector. Oh, um, and the actual incident itself. Oh, right, yeah. Dreadful. But then the whole world's gone to shit, hasn't it? And this is a clip I show a lot to express the problem of putting vertical video on TV. It's funny, of course, but there's a very uh, hard truth in there that we as broadcasters tend to forget that nowadays shooting vertical is not as wrong as it used to be because there is literally a generation that, uh, well, maybe we should just say it like it is, is too lazy to turn their phones. So they watch all their content like this. So we can be very stubborn and say, no, that's wrong, we should shoot it like this. Um, but maybe it's time for us to also make content like this, like the BBC who also made this clip already does in their, uh, their app. Though there is a middle way, I mean, you could think about what your main outlet is, that is still linear television. Do you want a reporter out there shooting the best picture vertical and then you have to put it like that uh, on your linear television? So if you shoot it, if you are a linear television company, maybe shoot horizontal and crop it. Absolutely, you can, you can do that. And uh, always consider when you're shooting in uh, 16 by 9, so horizontal, uh, that's usable for TV and then uh, cropping it, but doing it the other way around makes no sense. Uh, because people who are, will watch it vertically will watch it on a smaller screen, so they don't need the HD quality. It will still look good if it's just a little bit less. So think about that. Remember how a new screw uh, used to look? And uh, uh, that's... How, how long do you guys think this, this was? How old is this picture? <laughs> it is actually about a year ago, but it could have been last week. There are still many of us that shoot in this way. You can even, uh, you can't see it in this picture, but there was also uh, a radio reporter just standing back there. So there was a crew of four people interviewing one guy for one minute of television. Um, and there are better ways to do that. Yeah, we're not saying that the television crew is history, that is rubbish. We would say that the mobile phone has advantages that we should look at as well, as well as we will still need proper linear, good old television crews. So uh, at Omar Frischlon, we actually use uh, a Mojo a lot now, mobile journalism. And uh, look at how happy this fellow looks. See that? And he, he resembles him, doesn't he? No, he doesn't. A little bit, I think. That's not me. <laughs> well, but he uses my equipment. I mean, basically, what he's ha uh, holding, that's what I go out to shoot with. I have a tripod, I have my phone, and I have a, uh, a microphone, wirelessly. So that's what I use to make my, my daily news content. And uh, um, I, I, I started out alone <coughs> in 2014. There, look, that tiny thing up there, that's me. And then there were two in 2015. And slowly but gradually, uh, all of the reporters in our uh, station uh, learned about mobile journalism and learned how to use it. And now around about 50 people in our station know uh, um, how to shoot footage on their mobile phone and use it for TV purposes. Um, even our marketing department uses it uh, for their content. It's, it's a, proper tool, a proper tool in our daily toolbox. Um, so what does that look like when you shoot something with a mobile phone? Is it actual quality? That's always the question. So let's watch one of my reports. Nou, mijn naam is uh, Henk Prins. Ik ben in Haas. Ik heb een soort vrije tijd, want ik ben een pensionado en ik ben er elke dag op uit. Uh, wandelen, fietsen, brommerken. En dan uh, kom je in en dan denk je van, oh, is je een soort los. En, Dan uh, ging ik automatisch een beetje op opbouwen. Ik, uh, ik, uh, ik heb altijd de fiets thuis en vol. Ik heb altijd de hand vol met rotzooi. Ik ben altijd op, aan het oprijden. Er loopt altijd wel wat om op te rijden. Ja, wat is het nou? Wat krijg ik voor hè? 
Dit is een stuk plastic, waarschijnlijk beschermingsmateriaal of zo. Ik weet het net precies. Het is dik, dik, foamachtig plastic. Maar zulke dingen vind je dus regelmatig? Ja, regelmatig. De laatste weekend vind ik het een heel soort is een rotzooi. En dat is, uh, ja, ik, ik, ik probeer te achterhalen wat het voort komt, maar ik ben er nog net achter. Nou, ik doog dit uh, net omdat het zo raar steert, want het, uh, het boeit mij net zo vol. Maar ik doog dit omdat het een groot probleem is. Het is in een grote ramp wat er over heen komt. Het zal mijn tijd wat worden, ik ben 64. Maar uh, de volgende generatie die zadel je op, maar ik, een hele grote probleem maar, wat, wat betreft de plastic shop. En ja, helpt het dat Joe dit opredt? Dat moet wel. Ik haal uh, wel eens een beetje ontwijfel voor mezelf. Want het is een soort werk. Maar uh, ja, dit moet wel helpen. Elk stikje wat net in het wetter komt, dat is een stukje minder wat, uh, wat in uw uh, voedselketen terug te komen. I actually never saw it on such a big screen. <laughs> so I hope the quality was good enough for that big screen. But I think it. it, it no, no, would anyone have any trouble using footage like this on their TV screen? We actually had a student at my news lab and she was doing a little research on if audience notices and she had topics, uh, little reports on six topics. One was mobile, one was uh, classic uh, television crew. No one noticed. Well, the audience didn't notice at all. So um, <coughs> maybe a little background to that story. I was uh, at his house at 11. Um, and I had to uh, fill in my radio report at 12, because it has to be on air at 12. So I had one hour to uh, be with him and edit my radio uh, piece. I actually edited my radio piece while sitting him in, in, next to him in that beautiful car, <laughs> and then we continued shooting, because I had extra time by doing it that way. Because uh, Mojo really is Lightweight, which is a big uh, advantage. You don't have to carry too much stuff outside. Uh, it's quick and it's multi-platform. And as we have learned earlier today and yesterday, being multi-platform is very important for us as public broadcasters nowadays. If we don't get our content out on more than one platform, well, we can't live from just TV. We experienced the same at NDR in Hamburg. We've been using mobile journalism for about two years now in our news lab. And imagine like a, a typical, not so important, but still important enough to report it topic, like a strike at a regional airport. Normally, if we would go there with our camera crew, the strike would start at six in the morning. We would be with our camera crew out there around 6.45, the camera crew, if it is a quick one, uh, would finish shooting. Um, about uh, three quarters of an hour later, we arrive at NDR because we drive back because it's not important enough to have a satellite news, news gathering car there or anything. And then, of course, we would only start editing around 10 o'clock because our first uh, regional news in Hamburg go out around two, so we don't have capacities to edit earlier. So the first video that, like for a normal everyday topic, would go online uh, around 2:30 after the linear television show, which is, of course, rubbish. You could change that if you wanted to, but it would cost money and capacity. You would have to have an editor in earlier. So you do that for important stuff, not for everything. If we send out a reporter um, with a mobile phone, the strike would start still at six o'clock. He would arrive, he would look around, he would do his research, and while he does that, he would shoot some pictures. So that around 6.30, he would know what to tell in a first report. He would stand himself in front of his smartphone, make a little piece to camera, add some pictures that he has shot before, and around 6.45 he would upload a little form that we would call a news reporter that is especially interesting um, in developing situations for breaking news. Um, that will go online around 7.15, and I admit that I've kind of emphasized the time differences between the two models. And as we did this, our national news saw it online and thought, whoa, those are not nice pictures from Hamburg, let's have them. And they even made their way into uh, um, national news. And this is how it looked. And it took him only around 40 minutes to do it himself on a phone. 
des Hamburger Flughafens. Verdi hat die 850 Mitarbeiter dazu aufgerufen, die Arbeit niederzulegen. Wie viele diesem Aufruf nachher folgen werden, ist noch unklar. Das konnte mir tatsächlich auch Verdi noch nicht sagen. Im Terminal sieht es tatsächlich so aus, dass es bis jetzt wenig Verspätungen bzw. gar keine Verspätungen gibt. Ob das tatsächlich nachher den Tag so bleiben wird, das ist noch total unklar. Verdi rechnet allerdings ähm, durchaus mit Verzögerungen, besonders im Bereich der Gepäckabfertigung. One tripod and you have a little thing you could show on national news in your first editions about an hour later. Yep. Um, so um, we know it's lightweight and we know that it's quick and that it's multi-platform. But um, the most important thing, of course, is storytelling. And does it really improve our storytelling? Um, I believe it does. Why? There's two reasons. First of all, because um, I don't have to deal with all the technology I have to bring. When I used to go out with my VJ set and my radio gear and everything, I was carrying three or four bags. And I was so busy with setting it up and pressing the right buttons that the, that the story, well, was second, uh, never first. Uh, but it also goes for the one on the other side of the camera, the ones that are being interviewed. When you come in with a big camera, um, or maybe even with a cameraman, so two-person crew, it changes people. They are not as relaxed as you might want them to. And if you bring technology that everybody has in the back of his pocket, they know the technology, they can use the technology themselves, so not they're not afraid of it. And I have found that they are far more open uh, in telling what they want to tell. Um, so I think that it's better storytelling. There are disadvantages, of course. Some stories can't be told with a phone. If it's really dark, it's really difficult. Your phone is wide-angled, so if you want to see something from far away because it's investigative reporting, whatever, you want to see drug smugglers back there, it doesn't work with a phone. Absolutely. So, of course, not everything works, but some things really help you tell your story. And the great thing is, formerly television was this very slow elephant. You needed big, expensive technology, and that made you slower compared to radio journalists and, uh, and, and newspaper reporters. Because they could just stay with the story and they could call in and tell what's happening and still stay there. When in the old days we would make a report on everyday life, for example surrounding the OCE summit in Hamburg last year. What would we do? We would go there with the camera crew, expensive, so we would stay for an hour, ask the people, how does it affect your everyday life? And they would tell us how. We would ask them to walk from right to left and left to right in front of our camera and then go back because we have to edit. At this OCE summit, we send out teams of mobile reporters and they stayed with their protagonists the whole day. So they really stayed with everyday life while they were producing their packages. So they really experienced everyday life. We got pictures that no camera crew got, for example, uh, uh, heavily armed police guards on the roof searching for something. No one had that because we were there the whole day. And we really got an impression of everyday life. So I think in times of as we say, Lügenpresse in Germany, fake news, people criticizing us for not getting the story right. It is also easier to approach people and it is easier to kind of immerse yourself as a reporter with your story, stay there while you report, which is a great chance of uh, um, a mobile reporting. It is a bit like television is becoming radio or newspaper again. It's, it's, it's getting easier to do it. You can get more people to do it. We need a day or two days of training if someone knows a little bit about television to get the basics right. So the BBC has started training people doing mobile journalism first and if they like it they go on to becoming a video journalist with a bigger gear. So the, te technolog uh, the, the technological hurdle is lower. We've done the same thing following people for a whole day with local politicians. We could not have afforded to do that with news gathering trucks, with camera crews and everything. We've done that um, with, lo with uh, a mobile crews. We followed politicians to just show how everyday life as a politician is in, in these days. And this is a quick example of how it looked in the end. Perfekt. Das erste haben wir schon mal. Oh 
Bürgerschaftsabgeordnete Wolfgang Rose hat so etwas noch nie erlebt. Der Angriff macht ihn wütend. André Triepoll ist als Fraktionschef Berufspolitiker. Einen Aufenthaltsraum oder gar ein Clubhaus gibt es nicht. Man redet von Integrationszusammenleben. Früher engagierte sich Joachim Körner bei Amnesty International. Heute sitzt er für die AfD in der Hamburger Bürgerschaft. Ein letztes Mal geht Jennifer Dutschke durch ihr Manuskript. Senatorin Fegebank muss natürlich auch zur Kelle greifen. Topic number one on Twitter with such a uh, small project possibly only shows how small the Twitter bubble is, but we were still happy. So, um, uh, being able to use mobile journalism for our everyday jobs is nice and uh, nice to have, but it's also nice to be able to experiment with what you can do, and that's something we at Omer Frisland did uh, last December when we wanted to make a show on Facebook about how the year had been, how our year was, how our programs went. Um, but we didn't want it to do it in the traditional way, because the traditional way would be rather expensive, uh, bringing in cameras and old crew. Um, so they decided to have a one-person crew, which is me, <laughs> uh, handling four cameras and doing the directing and the audio technology. I have never worked so hard in one hour, but... <laughs> Aside from that, I was very happy with the way it looked because, um, does it start? Yeah. Um, I'm just edited a little bit uh, uh, from the one hour show because it was a one hour show with guests, with a car, uh, Wheel of Fortune, with people commenting and, uh, uh, well, changing cameras all the time. It was a proper TV show on Facebook, which was a really great thing to do and we would not be able to do it if not for the mobile phone. I use three iPhones and an iPad, a Wi-Fi connection and two microphones and that's it. We did a, a I think a very fun show. I could have had the sound in it but it's in Frisian yeah. so you wouldn't understand probably. We even had clips to play in so that was a really fun thing to do and it really got some engagement going. We used the same setup for uh, a radio talk show that we did in a local theater and put it out live on Facebook and were surprised by how good the results were with the same software. And we offered it to a national television news channel and they said, yeah, we, we take it, quality is good enough. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's surprising. How do we do it and how do we implement it? That I think is a really important question because many people in our technology production departments feel it's the journalist taking away their jobs. It's the smartphone. Uh, killing the camera, and that is not the case. We have um, set up our news app in a way that we have some reporters who come to the news app for a week and go back, like a lab day or like a lab week. So they bring in the input from their departments, they come from different departments, and they go back and talk about what we do. So we don't sit on innovation, but we try to get it into as many areas as we can. And we have people from the production department who do it with us. We have one guy from the camera department, one guy from the outside broadcast department. We've got one editor, Uh, and we've got a team of colleagues from like the infrastructure department and they come in for a week tell us what their problems are and go away as missionaries and tell people what we do and by this I think we don't erase all the fears that there are about what will my work look like in five years from now but we create a feeling of we do it together so journalists and technicians cameramen um, and reporters do this together. It's development that we need from both sides in order for it, for it to make it work. If the journalist is kind of going over the fence and doing technological work, you will have some production people to go over the fence to do a journalistic work as well, I think, in order to make it a development that is sustainable and that is supported by everyone in the company. Uh, and we kind of manage to do that, but I think it's important to include everyone. So don't do it only in your... Uh, editorial department that I think wouldn't work and would create tension within your company. But usually when you go out to a journalist and tell him that he has to handle his own technology, this is probably the face that he has, because we tend not, not to be technicians, um, so to get started it helps to have a nerd in your department, yep. <laughs> might we say that, yep. um, to, to get over that first scare. And for the next five minutes, we are going to try to get you over that first scare uh, by showing what you really need uh, to get going. Uh, this is not it. 
<laughs> Although this supposedly is an actual Japanese journalist doing an actual story on, I, I, I think, multiple platforms. I hope. But I don't want you to go out like this, but rather more <laughs> like this for TV. But let's start with radio. For radio, you could go out <coughs> with this. Just this. I'm going to show it on the big screen if that works. Here we go. And I'm going into a little app called Ferrite. Is it on the screen? Yep, yes, there we are. And what you have with this little app is basically your editing and your recording in one. You can see in the top of the screen that there's a little microphone and these bubbles going around it. These bubbles are how loud the sound is. You can see it, right? <coughs> if I connect an external microphone, something I cannot do now because I plugged into the big screen, it will immediately recognize that microphone. So you can connect your Sennheiser or whatever you want and have high quality audio. Now, to start recording, I need someone to interview, of course. Um, so could you please join us on stage? Hello. Give Hello. him a round of applause. He didn't yeah, have applause there yet. Is. There you are. Look at him, <coughs> brave man. <laughs> ah, he was awake and didn't go to the toilet when we asked him to be here. I'm going to interview now. Um, so uh, don't be afraid. I'm just going to press that little microphone on the screen. So how are things going here? Very well. Great, I would say. You're happy so far? Really happy. Good. Now, now we have a small interview. Now let's go and edit that. I'm going to press the little pencil and there you go. There's our wave pattern. We have a small wave pattern to work with. We can do a fade in, fade out. But I'm going to show you an actual project I did a little earlier. Uh, there we are. And you can see how that might look if you have a multi-track uh, audio recording for your radio broadcast. Uh, this was something I recorded two weeks ago. Uh, I was there uh, uh, again at, um, well, about 10, and it had to be on the radio at 12, whilst I was also shooting the uh, videos. Uh, but I just sat in my, down in my car and edited this before I uh, uh, went back to shooting. And it's really a multi-track uh, solution, so you have all the software you need. If people ask us what, would, what gear do we need to buy, I would always answer, I think you're with me, the one thing you probably need is one microphone for good sound, because sound is always the stuff that kills the picture. Your pictures will be good, your phone shoots perfect. So this is the one thing that I would advise everyone needs. If you want to set up a television interview, don't go away. <laughs> If you want to set up a television interview, we do it with uh, an app, and I think that is recognized worldwide by now, that is Absolutely. called Filmic Pro. Why do we use Filmic Pro? Because it can shoot in television quality. You can shoot 50 frames per second, and you can um, uh, um, properly align um, focus and exposure. And Would you come over here for a quick interview? And this app is actually so good that also Steven Soderbergh and the likes use it for uh, shooting their films to actually get that cinema quality because you can uh, also choose to shoot in 24 frames per second for example or shoot in the wide cinema-like uh, format. So we shot ourselves in the Nina with using an iPhone 7 having a ah, TRS. Right. That was really clever <laughs> of us. So you would need an adapter that we didn't yes. bring. But this is the one microphone that we would rec uh, recommend you to use. And then you just clip it on and put it into your phone if you can and uh, align the interview properly. And then you can use, um, this is the focus, the little uh, thing that's moving. You can fix it. This is the exposure, you can fix it and you start recording. Uh, and that's really all it needs. It's not that clever to do it against the light, so we would probably do it rather that it's way. It's not the best picture ever, shall so you So it's shoot. really clever. But, but why do we use Filmic Pro? We said uh, because it's easy to use, good to use. I don't show you the edit uh, no, let's program because we're out of time. Wise. We recommend an app that is called Luma Fusion because it follows the television workflow. There are still people running around the country, not even not only this country, but all countries, who recommend iMovie. Well, iMovie takes 50 frames away from you that you want in linear television and converts it down to 30 frames. So if you want a workflow that works for television, closely look at what apps uh, you want to use and what apps you need. And Filmic Pro and LumaFusion are two apps that really give you 
a, a perfect workflow for television. And as you are a television broadcaster, you want to produce material that you can use on television, otherwise you can just start shooting yourself yeah, into absolutely. the knee and uh, digging your own grave, I think. And, and one more thing about gear, maybe. Um, don't go nuts in buying gear, because there's a lot of stuff out there. Thank there's you. gimbals, there's <laughs> external lenses, there's, well, everything you can think of, it's there. But keep it, keep it simple. That's the best way to go. But don't go too simple. I mean, don't buy if a flimsy tripod of 15 euros and a Chinese microphone of 10 euros and then try to get the same results because quality does still matter. <laughs> this is 45 euro and it's good quality. Absolutely. So you're not talking about TV prices, you're still talking consumer goods. So, And if you have more questions and if you want to see how we use the gear, if you want to touch the gear, we'll be outside and you find us underneath the banner that looks like the book. And we have books with us. So if you want to have a look into the book, we kind of finance it ourselves. You can buy it. We give you a special price today. Absolutely. Isn't that nice? So thanks a lot for your attention. And thanks for inviting us here.